case she might. Okay. Well, this one's for you. <laughs> okay. I heard a story about a Texan, a very wealthy Texan. He had a huge estate, a 100,000 acre estate, and he was very famous for putting on these incredible dinner parties where people from all over would come. He had a swimming pool, a big one, and in the swimming pool, he kept sharks. Have I told you this story before? Okay, all right. <laughs> that would stink, wouldn't it? Uh, one evening after dinner, he said, y'all, <laughs> I, I can't do a Texan accent, here we go. If any of you all want to swim from one end of the pool to the other end of the pool and you get out alive, I'm gonna give that person one of three things. Number one, I will give you either $1 million or number two, I'll give you half of my estate. That's a lot more. Or I'll give you my daughter's hand in marriage. At that moment, there was a splash in the water. Everyone turned to look to see who it was that was in the pool. They saw someone swimming like crazy from one end of the pool to the other. He reached the other end and climbed out just as the shark slammed into the wall, just missing him. Everyone was amazed. The rich Texan said, Woo-wee, boy! <laughs> That was amazing. No one has ever taken me up on that offer. Which one do you want? Do you want, which one do you want? Do you want the million dollars? The guy goes, no, I, I don't want the million dollars. He says, okay then, how about half the estate? No, you can keep it, I don't want it. Well, then you want my daughter's hand in marriage. No, I, no, I don't. Well, what is it? What is it that you want? I want the name of the person who pushed me in the pool. <laughs> That actually went over better than I thought. Well, praise the Lord. <laughs> Let's pray. Lord, I pray that you would push us in your pool today, the pool of the Holy Spirit, the pool with Lord God, that people, I come against uh, slumber, the spirit of slumber that would have us not receive what you want to speak today. I come against that thing that would cause us to be lethargic and then not move into action what you've called us to do. Lord God, we have that authority today because of you, Jesus. You have all authority. And I pray to the Lord God today that our hearts would be receptive to what you're ready to speak to us today, that we would be changed. Amen? amen. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We're going to start kind of a new series here today, and it may seem uh, basic, but please hang with me, okay? Okay. Um, I want to talk about a, a label of this series called This We Believe. And if any of you have ever uh, joined Faith Outreach Center as a member, you've had to go through what was called the membership class. And in that class, you learn the history of Foursquare, you learn the history of this church, and then you also learn what do we believe. We live in a world today that does not know what it believes. The devil loves to hide behind confusion and lies. And he's very good at it. And these same two attacks are also attacks that's happening within the church. There's lots of people, who, and we have different people from various different denominations and brand new saved people. Hallelujah. We're so glad you're here. Your family. I'm your brother. Praise the Lord. But I want you to know, even within something like this, sometimes we bring, for lack of a better word, baggage of things that we believe how God is or how he used to be or whatever it may be. We bring baggage about certain theology. And so what we want to do is we want unity. You know God is all about unity. If there's no unity, it's like a house divided against itself. With no unity, you're not marching in the same direction and you're not marching all together. You're just kind of scattered doing your own little thing. God has called his church in unity. God is all about unity. You got God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. And he calls us into that same unity. And he calls his church, and we are his church, we're not ourselves. And because we are his church, he's called us to march in certain directions. And in order to do that, we have to understand, we have to believe, and we have to be unified in the things that we believe when it comes to God, the Bible, and theology, and many other things as well. We can differ on some things a little bit, but there's some things that are very, very essential. How many of you guys would agree with me on that? Amen. All right, praise the Lord. We're all together on that. Like I said, the devil and demons, they thrive where confusion is. They love to bring confusion. The devil and demons, they thrive where lies are, and that these attacks have even happened in the church. I want to read you a scripture here, and this is God's warning to the church for the last days. This is God's warning to you and I. Let's listen to it. 2 Timothy 3, verses 2 through 5. 
For people will love only themselves and their money. They will be boastful and proud, scoffing at God, disobedient to their parents and ungrateful. They will consider nothing sacred. They will be unloving and unforgiving. They will slander others and have no self-control. They will be cruel and they will hate what is good. They will betray their friends. They'll be reckless, be puffed up with pride and love pleasure. They will love pleasure rather than God. Who's Paul talking to? This next verse, listen to this. They will act religious, but they will reject a power that could make them godly. Sounds like he's even talking to the church right there. They will act religious, but they'll reject a power that can make them godly. You know, what does that mean? I just want to kind of pause right there a little bit. That means there's certain things that God says, follow me in this way, and then you'll see my power in your life to transform you. You can't change yourself. I don't care how much you pay your psychiatrist. You can't change yourself in here, in here. God's the one who does the changing. So what we have to do is do things his way, how he leads, how he directs, how he instructs in his word. And then what happens? The power of God comes into our lives and saves us. So I want you to know that. It says they will act religious. In other words, they think they're saved. They'll act religious. or they'll, I, I know a lot of Christians, and please don't let this be you, that they, they know the things to say at church, but at home they're totally different. Totally different. Please, please, please don't let that be you. God's coming back for a pure and spotless bride, not for a fake, not for a phony. It says, they will act religious, but they will reject the power that could make them godly. Stay away from people like that. Religious people not sold out to God. Fakes. Bible calls them false believers. They think they're saved. That's the reason why the Bible also warns that they'll stand in the very presence of God, and God will say, depart from me. I never knew you. You were fake the whole time. You went to church, and you never allowed my words to come in. You never allowed my spirit to come in and make a difference in your life. And that's a terrible, 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 terrible thing to hear for all eternity. Uh, let's look at the last, and it also talks about false teachers. It's not just talking about false converts. It talks about false teachers as well. Let's continue on the next three verses. They are the kind who work their way into people's homes, these false teachers, and win the confidence of vulnerable women who are burdened with the guilt of sin and controlled by various desires. Such women are forever following new teachings, but they're never able to understand the real truth, the truth. These teachers oppose the truth, just as Janus and Jambres oppose Moses. They have deprived minds and a counterfeit faith, but they won't get away with this for long. Someday, everyone will recognize what fools they are, just as it was with Janus and Jambres. And, and I looked them up, and I don't want to talk about them, but it's interesting a little bit, some of the things about them. So we don't want false teachers. We don't want to be taught falsely. You don't want me lying to you. You don't want me giving you my opinion. You want me to give you the truth. Amen? Amen. If I, if you, you want everyone to give you the truth. And you should demand the truth and expect it. And you should test it as well. Um, in Philippians 2, 2, again, like I said, and why do we want the truth? Because we want unity. This says this, make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other loving one another and working together with one mind and one purpose. So for that reason, what I want us to do is to go back and look at some of these things that God says, this is essential. This is very important. It's not one of these that you can skimp on. It's not one of these that you can accept or reject whatever you want. These are important things. And that's what we want to talk about. And because why? Because we live in a world today. Listen to me and you know it. We live in a world today that loves to change the truth. And they're so confused that they're actually, listen, they're actually starting to believe the lies that the enemy is saying to them in their hearts. They're destroying their lives physically with this whole sexual gender thing that's going on. It's like crazy. 
with uh, the things that God approves of. They say God approves of it now because we've learned, we've evolved, and the Bible has evolved. I'm here to tell you, culture does not change the Bible. The Bible is meant to change culture. Amen. Amen. And so when you see someone wanting to take the Bible and change it to bend, to agree with what they want, that's a lie. Run from it or correct them and then run, okay? <laughs> don't, allow it to, it, don't allow it to infect you. Hallelujah. All right. So we want unity and we want to be united, especially, though, especially in these confusing and changing times. So each week we're going to look at some different beliefs. And uh, not all of them that we go through, but I want to tell you some of the beliefs that Foursquare has written. It says, this is what we believe, and this is what we all agree upon. And also, we agree with them as a church as well. And if you can agree with this, praise the Lord, we can all march in the same direction, hearing the same voice, doing what God has called us to do. Amen? Amen. Amen. Okay. So today, what we believe about the Bible. Say Bible what we believe about the Bible. I want to read to you right from Four Squares thing. And it, and it reads, it just, it's one of the longest sentences in the world. <laughs> okay. All right. Here we go. It's not up there, but you just have to listen to me. We believe that the Holy Bible is the word of the living God. It's immutable, steadfast, unchangeable, as its author is the Lord Jehovah that it was written by holy men of old as they were moved upon and inspired by the Holy Spirit, that it is a lighted lamp to guide the feet of the lost world from the depths of sin and sorrow to the heights of righteousness and glory. It's an unclouded mirror that reveals the face of a crucified Savior. It's a plumb line to make straight the life of each individual and even communities. I love that. Amen. It's a sharp two-edged sword to convict of sin and evil doing. It's a strong cord of love and tenderness to draw penance to Christ Jesus. And we're talking about the Bible here. The Bible is a balm of Gilead that can heal and quicken each drooping heart. The, one, the only true ground of Christian fellowship and unity. We find our unity in what the Bible says. Amen. We find our unity in what the Bible says. It is a loving call. I love this, of an infinitely loving God. It's a solemn warning, the distant thunder of the storm of wrath and retribution that shall overtake the unheeding. It's a signpost that points to heaven and a danger sign that warns from hell. The divine, supreme, and eternal tribunal by whose standards all men, nations, and creeds, and motives, they shall be tried by the word of God. That is the Bible. Amen. That's quite a bit, isn't it? <laughs> Hallelujah. So now here's the question. What? <laughs> what is the Bible? <laughs> what is the Bible? Well, let me just give you a little quick synopsis of the Bible as we know it. And again, I could tell you what, we could talk about this subject for weeks. We really can't, but I'm just going to give it to you in one week, okay? And that, so we'll be here for like five hours. Okay, here we go. <laughs> Number one. It was written over, over, over a period of 1,500 years. It wasn't written all at once. 1,500 years, the whole Bible was written. It has 40, at least 40 different authors. And some of these authors are kings, scholars, poor people, philosophers, fishermen, poets, historians, teachers, prophets, and there's even a doctor. Those are some of the authors that wrote the Bible. They wrote different types of literature. The Bible, is, it's, it's a combination of 66 different books into this one big book we call the Bible. And there's different types of literature in it. Number one, there's history, lots of history, accurate history. The world looks to it to be able to find certain things. They used to do that all the time. And they still do in some areas. Matter of fact, okay, I'm sidetracking. So anyway... <laughs> There's times people just say, oh, King David never lived. You know, the Bible says that we can't find any evidence, which, by the way, they've gone through the Bible for all the other things, and they have discovered true, 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 true. It's true everywhere. But then they said, ah, we can't find anything about David, so therefore the Bible, just scrap it. They just recently found this huge stone plaque, and it talked about the kingdom of David, and then they found some other stuff proving that the kingdom of David is real, so they have now shut up about that. The Bible is a wonderful, perfect, great, trustworthy history book as well. That's some of the things in it. So it wrote different types of literature, 
history. There's poetry in it. There's songs. There's eyewitness accounts. There's prophecies. And there's letters. So, I want you to know this. The Bible was 100% human authors. It's like, oh, can you trust a human author? The Bible is 100% human authors, but it's also 100% Holy Spirit inspired. <laughs> Let me give you an example for this, and I think it's a great example. We're going to throw up here a picture. How many of you guys ever heard of St. Paul's Cathedral? <clears throat> there it is right there. I'll kind of get out of your way. It is a huge thing. St. Paul's Cathedral was built in London by Sir Christopher Wren. And it was the greatest, he was the greatest English architect of his time. The construction started in 1675. He was 43 years old. And it continued under his direction for 36 years. That's how long it took to build this thing. So it was done in 1711, and he was 79 years old when it was done. While Christopher Wren, he built a cathedral, he never laid a single brick. He never erected a single pillar. He never drew anything on there. While he is the one uh, is accredited for building it, he never laid those things. There were many, many other people. There were stonemasons, there were carpenters, there were laborers, there were artists. All these people did that. But Sir Christopher Wren was the inspiration behind all of it. It's the same way with the Bible. The Bible has many different people, many different styles, many different backgrounds that wrote it. But the author of that and the one who inspired the whole thing is the Holy Spirit. So you can trust what it says. That's why the Bible seems, hey, sounds like a different author here. Yeah, because there is a different author. It's just the way they wrote. It's their styles. And God uses, you know, God uses your style. Isn't that something? God uses your style. He even uses that hairstyle you got. Praise the Lord. God uses us. God is the inspiration of it all. Listen to this, 2 Timothy 3.16. Matter of fact, I think we should all read it together. One, two, three. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. I love that last line. He, the Bible and when we take the Bible in, it prepares us to do great work for God, his work. And at the very beginning there, all scripture, say all. all. This whole Bible you can trust. Why? Because it was inspired by God himself. And it's not just man's idea, not just man's opinion. It is God inspiring men what to write, hallelujah, in that area. So the page, in the pages of the Bible, you're going to find some truth to believe. You're going to find some promises that you want to claim for yourself and your family. You're going to find some commands that you need to obey, and you're going to find some examples that you can follow. So that's what's in the Bible. The Bible tells us about God. The Bible tells us all about ourselves. And the Bible tells us how to live and helps us to know God, love God, and how to follow God. Now, the Bible, since it's all this, it must have an enemy since God's behind it. There is an enemy, Satan and demons. They're all the enemy of this. And the Bible has been attacked since its inception. Since they started writing, the Bible has been attacked. Its credibility has been attacked. They say, well, the Bible stole from this culture over here. Baloney, okay? I think that's Greek for baloney, okay? <laughs> it, the Bible has never stolen from any other culture. That is a lie. That's one of those internet infidel things that they just keep passing on back and forth and back and forth. It means nothing. They've never thought it out. They just throw out these lies and these claims. That's how the devil operates. Challenge people in that area. Challenge them. If they make that claim, the burden of proof is upon them. So the um, Bible has been attacked since its inception. Not only is the Bible the most loved book in all the world, but it's also the most bitterly hated book in the world. It really is. There's been attempts to squish the Bible, like I said, since its inception. I'm going to just, again, I, I can't go through all these, and I'm going to give you just a couple here, and there's modern day ones, like, still going on like crazy right now. But listen to this. Roman emperors, they sought to destroy God's word. And there's a particular guy I just want to give an example of. His name, I'm going to mess it up, but it doesn't matter. He's not here. Diocletian. Diocletian. He believed that he succeeded in getting rid of the Bible. 
He succeeded in getting rid of Christians. Why? Because he killed so many Christians. Because he burned so many Bibles. They had these big bonfires all the time that they would find any types of things. They would burn anything that had to do with Christianity. But what happened was the Christians went underground. They went quiet and they took the word and hid it with them. And so at that point, he thought, victory's mine. So what did he do? He stamped a medal, a medal, and I don't know what he did. I don't know if he wore it, if he, I don't know what happened, but this is what was inscribed upon it, and they have it. The Christian religion is destroyed, and the worship of the gods restored. <laughs> Listen to what Jesus says in Matthew 24, 35. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. <laughs> My word will never pass away, Mr. Diocletian. <laughs> Check this out. 25 years later, after Mr. Diocletian, his, his successor, Constantine, you know what he did? He issued another edict, ordering 50 Bibles to be published at the government's expense. <laughs> Amen. You, know, you can try your best. God's going to win. <laughs> Join the winning side. Join the winning side. Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. How many of you guys have ever heard of a guy by the name of Voltaire? Voltaire. Not bald hair, but Voltaire. <laughs> I am scratching my head thinking about that. He was a French philosopher. He was a French enlightened dude. He would write stuff, and he was vehemently against the Bible and Christianity. And here's what he said. He says, he made this prediction. The Bible will become a museum piece within a hundred years of my lifetime, and it will be replaced by advanced philosophies. Instead, you know what? The Bible has become the most popular book in all the world. The most popular. Here's the problem, though. That's great. We can share that. But is it making a change and making a difference? You can have it at home, setting, collecting dust, and you just bought it and you made it popular, but is it, make, is it doing the work in you? If we believe what we say about the Word of God, then we would be all about the Word of God in our life as much and as often as we can. Really. Then it went quiet. Okay, here, here we go. It is the most popular book in the world. Each year, over 100 million Bibles are sold and given away. How many of you guys have on your phone or your iPad the, the Bible app? The, uh, uh, what is it? What is it called? U version? U version Bible. How many of you guys have that? That has been downloaded over 200 million times. 200 million times. By the way, when I told you that 100 million is bought each year, you know what that comes out to be? 50 Bibles every minute. That's like one every second just about. That's amazing. It is also, it's, and by the way, it's also been the best seller book ever since books have been printed. And, and it got so to the point that, all right, what's the number one book this year? It's the Bible again. You know, <laughs> They actually took it out and put it in its own category so that other people could at least have a chance, you know, fame, whatever it may be. But it has been and will be week after week, in and out, and it's been the best-selling and most loved book in all the world, in all the world. It's also the most powerful book. Amen. It has the power to change individuals, and it has the power to change society as well. It really does. The Bible is the primary source. By the way, it is the primary source of the creation of the United States of America. Yeah. If you don't know that, you really have to believe it. The world may try to tell you, oh, they were a bunch of deists. Well, they're a bunch of dummies because that's not true. There might have been one or two. But the majority of them was, they were, I don't know if they were spiritual, but I'm pretty sure they had to be because they were listening to God and they were in the Word of God. And they, of all the uh, articles that they wrote, of all the papers that they wrote, the Bible was the most quoted source from writing all those early papers that made this nation the greatest nation on the face of the planet. Amen? Amen. We didn't make it. The Bible did. Amen. God did. God's word. God honors his word when we honor his word. And when we honor his word, he honors us. Amen? So, uh, it shapes nations. Let me just give you a couple of these. And like I said, I, I'm not exaggerating when I say you can read books of the stuff that people have written about the Bible and how it shaped the United States of America. George Washington said, it is impossible to rightly govern the world without God and the Bible. He was known for reading the Bible continuously. His uh, aides, they would find him in the morning. He would wake up in the morning and he eating his breakfast, he'd be reading the Word. Before he went to bed, he'd be reading the Word. And at times they would walk in and they'd find him on his knees before the Word of God, reading it as well. This man was serious about the Word of God in his life. Our first Continental Congress, it was open with Bible reading and prayer. 
It needs that today, doesn't it? James Madison signed a federal bill that provided money for a Bible society to mass distribute the Bible. The government paid. Yes, we realize this is what made us great. Let's get it out there in the hands of everyone. Education. Who's ever heard of the primer? Who, who made the primer? The New England primer. What it was, they would take scriptures, and that's how they would teach the ABCs. A, I, I forget how the first one goes. It rhymes, and I'm not going to. A is for Adam, who sinned, and through him, all creation rebelled, whatever it may be. But anyway, for every letter, there was a scripture that the students had to memorize. They would use the Bible. And by the way, you know why they wanted a nation that could read also? So they could read the Bible. Yeah. So they could read the Bible. Noah Webster, he said this, education is useless without the Bible. The single most cited authority in, in the Founding Fathers' writings was the Bible. So the Bible shapes society. And it's not just shaping the United States of America. It's shaped, I've, I've heard stories, and, and I love these stories, where these villages finally bow their hearts and their knees to God. Now, here's the problem. When you bow your heart and knee to God in some of these places, they still hang on to their old religions and their old gods. And you just can't mix them. You're not going to have the blessings. You're not going to have the victory in your life. And so when they finally let go of those other gods, their villages had just turned around. This one particular village, not this one. Matter of fact, in this area, all the villages, all of them, the mortality rate for the youth was just so incredibly high. Why? Because they were constantly attacking each other. They were constantly using their demons to curse each other so that the children would die of various diseases. And they would do this again and again, all the time, continuously, till finally one tribe accepted the truth of the gospel. And they saw the power of God work in their lives. And they surrendered to it all. That tribe grew. That tribe didn't have fear. That tribe didn't have to build walls around its uh, huts and everywhere. They didn't have to go into the jungle to hide from other people trying to attack them. And it caused all these other villages to say, what are you doing? It says, we follow a totally different God. We follow the spirit, the great spirit, Holy Spirit. So I'm telling you, it, it changes cultures. It changes cities. It changes nations. But it also changes individual lives. I love that. That means me. How about you? It shapes individual lives. You know what happens when you read the Bible four or more times a week? Uh, they did a survey and a study with 60,000 Christians. And in this study, they, uh, they found this, that if you read the Bible once, twice, or three times a week, it really didn't make that big a change in your life. It didn't change your habits. It didn't change your, uh, the things that's going, your character or whatever. It was very little change in behavior and habits. But check this out, and I don't know why. Once you read the Bible four or more times a week, there was drastic change in behaviors and habit. Listen to this. Sexual sins and viewing pornography drops 61%. From the Word of God. Feeling spiritual stagnant also dropped by 60%. Amen. Anger and feeling of loneliness dropped 30%. <laughs> Listen to this one. Alcohol, alcoholism, 57% decrease. Bitterness in relationships decreased up to 40%. And if you read the Bible four or more times a week, you'll find that you're going to be sharing your faith and discipling others, and that's going to increase 220%. Praise God. Amen? That's God's word. God's word is still echoing throughout all of his creation, and it's still creating. It's still doing great things. It's still blessing. It's doing a great thing. So hallelujah. But here's the sad part. Over 60% of believers don't read their Bible. I'll let you and the Holy Spirit work on that. Amen. Let me give you an example. Uh, there's a story. Uh, I knew I was going to be talking about this, and then we have this program where we're in the jail and, and we get to take the Alpha Project into the jail to the inmates there. And this week happened to be about the Bible. <laughs> so I want to give you a story that came out of it. And we're talking about how the Word of God changes individual lives. Uh, there's a particular guy by his name is Earl Smith. He came from a very wealthy family. He was very wealthy to the point that he didn't have to work and he didn't work. He used his money to buy drugs. And he was into drugs so much and such heavy drugs that by the age of 30, he ended up in the hospital for a long time because of drugs. While he was in there, someone came and visited him 
And they said, here's a Bible. Let me give you a Bible. He was excited. He saw that Bible. He saw the thin paper. He started ripping it out and he started rolling, rolling joints and smoking the Bible. <laughs> he smoked Matthew, Mark, and Luke. <laughs> no exaggeration. When he came to John, he decided to read it. He read it. It got a hold of his heart. It changed him. He surrendered his life to Jesus Christ. And he was wonderfully saved. Wonderfully saved. He was so changed. And the people around him, when they saw him, they were changed as well. As a matter of fact, when he would go to a psychiatrist and he would lay down, she realized, what happened to you? And he shared what he read in the Bible and what the, God spoke to his heart and what it really meant. And he was so excited about it. And she goes, you have all this joy and, and yet you, you started out this way, but you have all this joy. She goes, I'm miserable. Probably because she has to listen to everybody. But anyway, <laughs> but I'm miserable. I want what you have. He shared the gospel with her. She surrendered her life to God as well. And later on, they got married, <laughs> which is illegal. I mean, you're not supposed to do that, but not illegal. <laughs> you're not supposed to marry your therapist, okay? Anyway, praise the Lord. How about some of these other individual cases? Who's ever heard of Warner Wallace? He is called the cold case detective. He is America's, one of America's greatest cold case detective. What is a cold case? That's something that happened years ago, and they don't know who did it, so they put it all in a box, and they store it on shelves, and it sits there for years. Now and then, they go back and visit those again, and they bring in these special, smart detectives who have special skills, and he is one of those, and he's one of the best in the nation. And he has solved so many 30-year-old cases. So anyway, his wife got saved. He goes, what? You nut? I, you know, I, I, I can't believe you got saved. He goes, you know what? I'm going to use my skills to prove to you this Bible is wrong and that there's no such thing as God. I'm going to use my cold case detective skills. I'm the best. Got into it. <gasps> it's true. Gave his life to Jesus. Radical. Now he travels the world talking about Jesus Christ and what he's learned in the Bible, which he went to go and try and destroy. The Bible, he went to change the Bible, he went to prove it wrong, but the Bible changed his heart and mind. Amen? There's another guy who's ever heard of Lee Strobel. Yeah, yeah he's a, was he a New York Times investigative reporter? Or Chicago Times or something like that? But anyway, he was a big one. He wrote the book Case for Christ. Same thing. His wife got saved. You nutty woman. <laughs> I'm going to prove this is not the case, and I'm going to use my investigative skills. Come to find out, this word is true. There is a God. Surrender to his life to God, and now he, too, travels around. There's another guy by the name of Josh McDowell. He wrote a book called Evidence That Demands a Verdict, and the same thing he wanted to know. He wanted to disprove the Bible. Check this guy out. And I'll just give you this last one. I don't know him until I investigated him. His name is Gary Parker. He was a biology and a geolog geology professor from Ball State University. And he says, I wasn't teaching evolution. I was preaching evolution. One day, someone says, hey, why don't you come to our house? We're having a Bible study. Can you imagine inviting someone who's preaching <laughs> evolution? Why don't you come to our Bible study? You imagine he would just say no. He came. He sat through it. He thought, I'm going to take this Bible home. And I'm going to, here's what he said. He says, I started studying the Bible primarily to criticize it more effectively. <laughs> his life was changed. He surrendered his life to God. He doesn't preach Darwin. He preaches Jesus from the Bible. Amen? Individual lives are saved by reading the Bible. The Bible, like I said, the Bible doesn't conform to culture. The culture conforms to the Bible when it's, when it's trusted, when it's believed, when it's preached with authority, when it's preached with power, when it's preached with enthusiasm. Cultures change. Church, you can change the world because you have the words of God in your mouth. <laughs> you have the words of God that you can speak into situations. And don't say, oh, it didn't happen right away. Get your butt back in there and fight. Get your butt back in there and fight. Amen. We, we're just one of these people that just so much, we're looking at TV we're, or video games, whatever it is, and the battle's over within a minute or two. Battles are long. Battles are hard. Battles continue on. And you have the victory if you stay in there. Amen? And you do have, you have the greatest weapon, the mightiest weapon, better, greater weapon than any nuclear arsenal out there, and that's the Word of God. Hallelujah. Um, through the Bible... God has spoken. Through the Bible, God still speaks. Say, still speaks. Still 
He's still speaking to hearts, speaking to minds, and God is still speaking. And the Bible could be called actually God's love letter. Who's ever heard the Bible called God's love letter? I used to write my wife love letter, letters. She kept them. My kids found them. <laughs> so I, I grabbed them. I'm looking through these things, and I'm going, oh, what? I can't believe <laughs> I wrote that? Oh, dear Lord. <laughs> Uh, okay, I know. She still has them, but I hit them. But anyway, <laughs> you think I'm joking. <laughs> but I'm just telling you, when someone writes something to you that means something to you, you keep it. Amen. God has written everyone in here a love letter. He loves us. Hallelujah. When you receive a love letter from someone, you, you keep it. Not because the letter's important but because the person who wrote it is. Your God is important. This, your Bible, is his love letter. John said, I'm sorry, Jesus said this in John 20. He says this, these things are written, these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ. He is the Son of God. And that by believing, you may have life. The reason why we have the Bible, so we can know God, who he is. We can have life. I want to throw something up there. It says the purpose of the Bible is not to study the Bible just for itself. The purpose of the Bible is to bring us into a relationship with Jesus himself. Isn't that something? Amen. Hallelujah. I saw that and I loved it and I want to put it up there. The fact that God gave us the Bible is evidence of his love for us. God communicated to all mankind what he's like, how we can have a relationship with him. And there are things we could not have known. There's things we could not have known if God had not written the Bible. That's how much he loves us. And I praise the Lord. That's why it's still here. It's still here because there's so many other people who need to hear it. Nations need to hear it. Individuals need to hear it. Your family needs to hear it. You need to hear it. I need to hear it. Our culture needs to hear it. Yeah. That doesn't mean they're going to believe it. Listen to me. They hate the fact that you quote the Bible. They hate the fact that you talk about the Bible. They hate that. Because it, it means nothing to them. Their spirit is dead. They're, it's not made alive. They don't understand it. To them it's fairy tale. But when you just keep the word of God. We can't use, listen, we cannot use the word of God to beat everyone to follow all its commands. It won't work. But we allow it to change us. And then the world sees us and they want what you've got. Amen? Hallelujah. So relationships matter. Uh, relationships is what it's all about. The best way to invest in a relationship is to hear God and to know Jesus. And that, we do that all through the Bible. Uh, matter of fact, I encourage you, if you're not in the habit of it, start with Mark, the book of Mark. People always say, John, I say start with the book of Mark. I've heard that before and I agree with it. It's, it's written for uh, non-Jews. It's written for us. And it just makes it understandable. And then you can go anywhere from there you want. Read some verses. Read them. And then pray about it. And then ask God, say, God, speak to me. What is it you're saying here to me? I need to hear you. And God will speak to you. He'll open up your heart. Open up your understanding, and he'll speak to you. I want to show you two videos which I kind of mashed together. One you've already seen before. It's very, very low quality, but I just love it. And it's how they handed out Bibles in China. In China, you, at this underground church, you can't have the Bibles, the real Bible. And so they're waiting for it. They memorize it. Some are put in jail, and all they can do is memorize little pieces of it. But they've never had the whole Bible in their hands, this group of people that you're going to see some Bibles were smuggled into this group, and when they saw it, they, they ran to it and pulled it out, and they hugging it, kissing it, holding it to their face. And then um, Dallas, you gave a good uh, teaching this morning, and this next video is exactly about what you teach. So let's watch this video. Please turn it up. Thank <laughs> you. 
I want to read you something. This is a quote from a man named Lewis Boyer. It says, In the word of God, it is God who speaks to us, who never ceases to speak to us in these words. Even though they have been fixed in their phrasing for thousands of years, he who makes us hear them today already had us in mind when he inspired them of old. And he is always present to address himself to us through them as if they were at this instant pronounce it as if they were at this very instant pronounced for the very first time God is ready to speak them into our lives as if he's spoken for the very first time and when you read it think of it that way as God speaking to you we 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 can't take the Bible lightly because it's being twisted it's being perverted even within the church walls so if you don't know, and if you just go by what people tell you, you're in very danger 
of a lot of stuff, a lot of bad stuff. You're in danger. And God will hold you accountable for not reading it yourself. Because of all the nations who has the freedom for the word of God and has the abundance of the word of God in an abundant various different ways, listening to it, reading it, watching, whatever it may be, we will be held at a higher accountability for not following it. You will. The Bible is very clear on that. To much is given, much is required. God doesn't want us to stay ignorant. He loves us. And I'll tell you what, we need to make the word of God a priority. We got to. Because who knows, I don't know, if the Lord should tarry a long time, however it may be, it could be that this could be taken away from us. I know that sounds crazy, but how many things is happening in the world today, even in the United States of America, you thought was crazy would never happen? We're living in end times. How do you know that? Because things are changing like that. Used to be what happened in California took three years, two to three years before it came to Indiana, and we adopted it. Now, with technology we have, we're all the same. We're all the same. Times are changing. We need the Word of God. So, the question is what do we do today? Well, get a Bible. <laughs> Uh, and listen, I, like I told the guys in, in the jail, I said, if you don't understand the Bible, if you don't know the stories, get a kid's Bible. There's it's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Uh, I've heard of so many great people, great men and women of God who knew nothing, and someone gave them a children's Bible, and they read it, and they hungered, and they went for the more meat. <laughs> they went for the adult Bible, so to speak. And their lives are changing, and they're changing lives. And it started with the children's Bible. And then we're going to be taken, said, do you want that? And, and even after the very end, they came up to us, hey, don't forget, you promised us that children's Bible. <laughs> and we're going to be taking it to them. Lives are going to be changed. It, it's just so neat to see that. It's just so neat to see that. And you want your life changed as well. You want your life protected. You want the blessings of God. God wants to bless you. So how should we respond? The first thing we should do is confess our sins and ask for forgiveness. Heavenly Father, right now we just come to you. Forgive us for not treasuring your word, for that's what it is. It is a treasure. It is a treasure. Forgive us for not valuing, forgive us for valuing the world's entertainment above your word. Forgive us for being indifferent towards your word, not caring. Forgive us for being skeptical for no reason and Lord just forgive us for neglecting your word we pray the Bible has the ability to change the world and it has the ability to change us and I thank you Father God that as we confess and that's what you need to do as we confess these sins to you Lord God you forgive us and there's something that's released there's something that opens up that allows God to do the great things in your life and you watch the word of God just come alive in your life right now value it go after it maybe um, I, I just want to say this and I read that I'm just as we're still praying I want to read something that I found and it says Christianity would be true even if the Bible never existed Christianity didn't originate with the Bible it originated with an event, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. There were thousands upon thousands of Christians before the Bible was ever written. But we have the Bible today. We have it. And so, Lord God, I pray that those who are seeking, those who are full of doubt, Lord God, I pray, Lord, that you'd open their eyes, open their hearts. In Jesus' name, that's all we need to say. God does the rest and his word. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Listen, when you learn, go ahead and turn up the lights if you would, please. Uh, if, when you learn that you, something like that, you should always, and you know that uh, not happening in my life, you should always stop and pause and ask for forgiveness, and God forgives. Will you please stand to your feet? I want to bless you. Lord, you are a blesser.
You're the giver of good things. You've given us your word. You've given us your son, the word of God in Jesus Christ. You've given us life everlasting for those who put their hope and trust and faith in Jesus and what they've heard and what they've read in your word, God. You've given us your spirit. You've given us so much good stuff, Father God. We lack nothing. And I pray, Lord God, that we would walk around like we don't lack anything. Amen? Instead of walking around like we want more. Lord God, you've given us everything. May we walk in the abundance and the fullness of which you've given your church today. In Jesus' name, and especially when it comes in concerning your word. Bless your people today, Father God. Bless them with boldness to share their faith with someone out there. In Jesus' name, and follow it up as they pray with signs and wonders, just as the disciples prayed. I believe that in Jesus' name. And all those who receive it, say amen. amen. In Jesus' name. Oh, I like that amen. That was awesome. Can we do that? Okay, never mind. God bless you, church. God bless you.